Okay, so hi, my name is Josh. I'm going to be moderating this session. It's called Strengthening Our Capacity for HIV, STI Prevention and Health Promotion. And just so you know a little bit about myself, I'm from the Great White North. I'm from Prince George. Um, and I study anthropology and economics, and I teach about HIV and hepatitis C with a holistic medicine wheel perspective. So to get everything started, we're going to be starting off with Maggie. She's going to be looking at from competence to capacity building, understanding the internet and sexual health research and innovation. So a little bit about Maggie. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the School of Communication at SFU. Her interests are in sexuality, gender, health, and technology. Her current work is, um, in progress is a qualitative study of HIV prevention and the internet in San Francisco and Vancouver. Her current loves in life are Mariah Carey and her scooter, Rhonda the Honda. So um, thank you very much for coming to my talk on this beautiful day in Vancouver. Um, so, like um, Joshua said, I'm going to be presenting some of my dissertation research today. And I'm going to be looking at some of the research and practice-based issues that are associated with new media technologies. So although there are a number of ways that the internet enhances work in this area, it also brings with it some unique challenges that I'm going to be talking about today. And most of these come, I will suggest, from the fact that the internet is both a technological achievement and a social phenomenon. And I think integrating those is important. So I'm just going to give you a little background on my study. So it's a qualitative study, and I use grounded theory. And I can talk about that with you later if you have questions. Um, so I did semi-structured interviews with gay men, with public health stakeholders. So I included people who worked in community-based organizations and people who worked in aid service organizations to get their perspectives. And I looked at technologists, so people who design apps. And I did um, my study in San Francisco and here in Vancouver. And I'm going to be presenting the San Francisco sample today. I've never actually been there, but. Um, anyway, it is nice, the painted ladies, yeah. So today I'm going to get us um, to try to move from thinking about the internet as just a tool that we use, which is you know, very good and well, but to also thinking about it as a system. And so by a system, I mean that it is a set of interacting, interdependent components that form an integrated whole. So if we think about it this way, we can think about which areas of our research and practice are strong and developed, um, which need to be strengthened, and moreover, how do we go about doing it? So today I'm going to be looking at this in three ways. And I'm, first, I'm going to examine some of the assumptions that we make in research and practice when it comes to using the internet. And so using the conference sort of question of you know, how do we know what we know? Um, the second are the new literacies, because there are new things that we need to understand, of, or not new things, but rather different things we need to understand. So asking what do we need to know and what do other people need to know. And the third are the future steps. So how do we share what we know and what are the barriers people face? So the first are the assumptions. And the first one I'm going to look at is the idea of early adopters and gay men as early adopters, particularly. Um, so this is something that's sort of the lore of technology research, and it's almost common sense to us. We just we say it off the top of our heads. And I used to say it off the top of my head, too. So this is the first one from um, an interview that I did with a technologist. And the second are just some that I grabbed um, from media discourse. So this is the creator of Guy Spy, and this is Fake Dan Savage, aka Real Dan Savage, on Twitter. And so this is just something that we say all the time. So. I'm somebody who's interested in where ideas come from, and so I sort of, I guess, did my homework. And from the literature, we know that it comes from one area, from the diffusion of innovations tradition that comes from my field in communications. It's an American communication scholar, from, and he wrote this in 1962. And so he sort of looked at how new ideas and innovations kind of circulate. And so he looked at them mainly in the post-war period, so things like the diffusion of ham radios, the diffusion of tetracycline by physicians and the adoption of hybrid corn by farmers in Iowa. So it suggests that you know, a successfully diffused innovation will go according to that yellow S-shaped pattern, that there are certain technological features that make it more or less easy to adopt. And the third is the idea that innovations don't just kind of come out, but we sort of have an active role in shaping them. So it's the idea that once the early adopters sort of take on this innovation or they're like the critical mass, that they'll talk to their friends, who will talk to their friends, and so we won't need any sort of outside influence to get people to adopt, right? Because we trust people that we know. So what might be some issues that we could take up with diffusion theory? And I'm a big fan of meta-analyses. So 
Diffusion theory emerged from a particular historical moment um, that did not have insignificant social, technological, and economic growth, so the post-war period, of course. Um, but thanks to meta-analysis, and Trish Greenhall, I think, um, over in London, sort of did an analysis of diffusion research, um, we also see some pretty liberal takes of what constitutes an early adopter. So, in the study of the adoption of corn, for example, Rogers decided that what made the farmers more cosmopolite was the fact that they went to Des Moines, Iowa very often. So, you know, no disrespect to people in Iowa. They, can, they are fine people. I'm from Winnipeg, so I can appreciate this, but, you know, um, it might not be exactly what we're thinking about today. And sort of the ways in which sort of, you know, Rogers talked about laggards or um, late sort of adopters was really just the sort of oversimplified view of them as kind of uneducated, simple folk. And I think that really oversimplifies the relationship people have with technology. And the third sort of question that I had was this idea of like how early are we talking about? So again in the corn study we see that the average uh, time frame for adoption was in fact 20 years. And so you know that's not the time frame that a lot of us are working in if we work in public health. Maybe it's one year, maybe it's a five year strategic plan, maybe a 10 year. So um, thinking about that I think is important. So the other thing is there's not really a lot of um, empirical research also, if, if we're empirically minded people, um, to actually support um, this hypothesis. Um, Tim Evanston over from DC suggests that most of these claims are assertions that come from self-interested tech communities or companies who promote marketing to the LGBT community. So we know that in the 1990s, glossy gay lifestyle magazines surveyed their readership, which tended to be highly educated, affluent white uh, people. And so perhaps they oversampled um, the population. Um, as researchers, we also know that the ways in which we ask questions can affect the kinds of data and knowledge that we mobilize. So, you know, the difference between asking someone what their sexual orientation is versus asking them in, if they're in a same sex relationship can make a big difference. Um, researchers from the Williams Institute, which is a LGBT think tank over at UCLA School of Law, suggest that not all partnered gay people feel comfortable declaring their sexuality in surveys. And what's more, like in the case of a census taker, like a person in front of you, um, they suggest that a higher earning gay couple would be more likely to report sexual orientation than a lower earning one. So we see how this happens in research. So then what do we do with this? Um, I'm a big believer that we shouldn't just completely abandon the idea, but look at other ways in which our relationship to technology matters. So most of what we know comes from business and marketing literature. So this is sort of a gap for us in health research if we're interested in going down that route. Um, some of the studies that I have looked at suggest that gender plays a much more important role in technology adoption than sexual orientation. And so I think a look, if we're, if we're interested in this idea of gay men and early adoption, you know, looking at the role of gay masculinity perhaps in adoption um, might be really interesting. The second point I want to get to is the importance of failure. Now failure is something that people do not like in public health and in a lot of areas. We feel like it's bad that we're wrong. Um, you know, the idea that there's sort of one size fits all approach to the internet research and practice is a misguided one. And um, I think if there was some perfect way to do this kind of work, we would have figured it out by now. So, um, but what I will argue is that much of what we actually understand about the internet and about health actually comes from these failures. So I think of failure as sometimes a pretty productive thing. So whether it's like the first example, and this is an interview participant, sort of talking about how they were very naive and thinking they could just adapt things that worked offline for the online, or whether it was another participant talking about the fact that they kind of just imagined you could do everything online and not have to have an offline component. These are things that we've learned along the way, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. But we also see that um, doing this kind of work requires us to sort of learn new literacies because the internet is always this evolving thing. You can never really put your finger on it. So there are sort of some things, and I, I use some like little internet things in my uh, presentation, but you know, we have to learn our technological literacies. So things like terms of services on websites, data collection and storage, how we securitize and store data properly. But the other thing I'm going to be talking about mainly are the social literacies, so thinking about ethics, the process of, of working with ethics boards on this and trying to um, you know, develop partnerships and also the tech community itself. So when I had um, interviews um, with some practitioners, this is a practitioner who told me it took them 10 months 
to get an acceptability survey approved by uh, IRBs. And um, the reason was because the IRB didn't have the technological literacy. And I'm not suggesting that all IRBs don't. I know SFU, when I did my ethics, it was, it was fine. And I didn't have these kind of problems. But at, at some places, they're not, I think, fully equipped um, to deal with it. So, you know, actually, what ended up happening, I'll tell you guys about this in a minute. Um, but anyway, yeah, so they sort of shared the way that they have to do it, which is explaining every single part and including all information, what the website is, what it looks like, what Facebook does, what it will not do. And I think that's an important part of work is explaining to other people what our work is about. So the second thing is the ways in which IRBs sometimes understand risk. So I thought this was a really interesting example because they talked about the, the idea that the uh, IRB they were working with understood the risks of the internet, which tend to be informational in the same way as a drug trial. And so risk still exists, but we don't really have, I think, a language or a framework to adequately deal with it. And so actually what ended up happening with them is they threw their evaluation out. And so they haven't published it because of this. So it's challenging because I think that there is a lot of work that's going on that we don't always know about unless we get to come to conferences like this um, because people sort of just keep it um, to themselves. But we also see another kind of literacy and that's a cultural literacy and that's around sexuality. So uh, anybody that does sexuality research will be familiar with this. So these are the App Store review guidelines and um, the Android Store has similar ones. So this is what they ban from their apps and so it makes it really difficult if we try to do sexual health kind of outreach over here. And so what, like, what is the difference between stimulating an erotic rather than an aesthetic or emotional feeling when it comes to sex? But I'm also going to suggest that it's not just about censorship, it's just about like attitudes people have. So um, if there are any tech people here, I'm not saying that you're all like this. I don't believe this at all. I think a lot of tech designers are great. But I think that this is a prevalent view in the tech community that we have to deal with. So this is a designer who talked about an app that they went to pitch. And they said nobody wanted to work on their app. Um, and they asked people if they'd be interested in collaborating and they said no, I'd rather work on a photo sharing app or something. And so they shared with me sort of their feeling of the stigma that, that, that there exists in sexuality research and kind of feeling like you're doing something wrong or, you know, that it's not acceptable. This person had the question of, you know, what would my family think? And it wasn't really the, their family that was the barrier, it was other people. So I want to finish this presentation by asking the third question of how do we communicate what we know and what are the opportunities and challenges that the internet presents? So new developments in HIV prevention are constantly challenging us to communicate um, our scientific findings to publics. I think that's a really important part. So whether that includes, you know, helping people make sense of study findings um, or, you know, discussing just how effective condoms are at preventing transmission during anal sex. Um, we're always engaged in science communication and debate and discourse. Um, so a few of my participants were surprised that, you know, we still haven't come up with better ways to better integrate sort of epidemiological data into the everyday kind of understandings of people. Um, but we also see that this is limited, again, not by technical, logical factors. We could easily do this, but by social ones. So this is geography, and this is um, a practitioner who talked about um, the need to integrate sort of real-time data, but how difficult it is in a city like San Francisco and related it to Vancouver as well. So if anybody, I mean, if anybody has some ideas about this, I don't really know a lot about um, integrating this kind of data, but I would love to hear from people if they know some of the challenges, other challenges. Um, another one, and I'm not sure that this is the case here in Vancouver, but I do try to think about places outside of my own sample, is also just capacity. So this is another tech designer who said, um, sometimes health departments have the data. It's not that they don't have the data to do real time kind of information, but Sometimes it's delayed in the system. So finally, five years later, after they clean the data, it's like, oh shit, there was an outbreak in the neighborhood. And so doing this real-time mapping is you know, important. And I think that these exist. And I see people nodding, so please come talk to me after. I'm very interested. Um, but we also see that there's another one, um, which is the social determinants. And I think um, it's a bit challenging because I think that's the sort of one blind spot of internet research. While I really like it and I think it's fun and um, it could be really useful, it's really hard to integrate those social issues. Um, 
So these are what practitioners have sort of shared with me. Um, I do know that Barry Adam had done an HIV stigma webpage, and bravo to you. I think that that's really important, and I think we need to have like a lot more of that kind of stuff. But also figuring out like actually how do we integrate those issues? And I, I think we have campaigns, you know, online that do address homophobia, but in the context of not only HIV prevention, but also in the context of broader gay men's health, I think is very important. Um, how much time do I have left? Five. Oh, super. Good. Yay. Um, and so the second one is this, this sort of idea of the fact that there's still a lot of stigma around disclosing. disclosing. And so this is more, I think, in the context of talking to someone about um, syphilis and chlamydia, but the idea that there is this awkwardness. And people share that with me a lot. Like, how do we, how do we help people like disclose to their current past partners, right? Like, what is the language? It's really difficult because nobody thinks that they're an expert in anything. So. Um, so it shows us precisely what I think we still struggle with, which is trying to reconcile these largely what I think um, are qualitative experiential issues within the framework of a, a research that demands numbers and goals. Um, no disrespect to the numbers people, I don't want to start a war, that's just my uh, qualitative opinion. But um, So thus far I think we've been really good at treating social issues as technological problems that we can fix through our um, devices. But I think now is the time for us to start figuring out, figuring out whether and to what extent we can address social determinants and social issues online. Um, so. I guess I talked faster than I thought and I was scared, but that's all right. Um, so to wrap up, uh, in today's presentation, I, I just really skimmed the surface of some common research and practice concerns in this field, and I have a lot more I'd be very happy to discuss. Um, so let's just say maybe I gave a little like trowel to dig deeper into some of the assumptions that we make, um, exploring some of those institutional and social challenges people do face, and identifying the future areas and issues we might want to consider. Um, by treating the internet as both a technological achievement and as a social phenomenon that encourages us to take a more systems-based perspective to this kind of work, um, I hope to use my own kind of expertise, I guess, as an internet researcher and maybe a wannabe sociologist to uh, help push us in different ways of understanding a medium that's highly dynamic, embedded in social, uh, political, economic pr processes, and ever-evolving. Um, so that's all I have for today. Thank you. And I just want to thank, so since I have time, I just want to thank Shirk um, for, for supporting my research. I want to thank CAHR for giving me some money to go to Hawaii in a couple weeks. Uh, SFU School of Communication and FCAT, they've been really big supporters of my work. Um, CBRC, I think, has been a great place for me and the uh, very cute investigators. Uh, yes, I'm very sorry I missed your presentation yesterday. Um, my participants' friends who have given me advice, books, ideas, and compliments on outfits. And you can find me on Twitter. I yell at TransLink a lot about their very poor lighting. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, let's continue conversations. And, yeah, thanks. <laughs>